Wyndham Lewis on science, puritanism, and the feminine, in which he is commenting on a book by J.B.S. Haldane, which I believe is the scientist who, when asked what his career had taught him about the nature of the creator whose work he had studied in science, he said, in other words, what did he learn about the nature of God? Haldane thought all he could come up with is an inordinate fondness for Wyndham Lewis on science, puritanism, and the feminine. In Daedalus, recently published, Professor Haldane has briefly prophesied the triumph of ectogenesis, placing its experimental realization in the year 1951. In spite of the fact that he asserts that opposition to these innovations will come from the feeling of the conservative majority, that such innovations have an air of presumption and indecency, it is not really the majority that is, in, that is in question. And of course, what is intended in any case is to stress the essential indecency of the present arrangement and of the great decency of the proposed ectogenetic realization of life, all of which confirms us in the conviction of the essential puritanism and squeamishness of the scientific outlook, the outlook that is of the average man of science. The substitution of the doctor for the priest is not really as it would seem to be in the interest of carnal joy. Science as a religion would be a very austere affair indeed, outdoing all it is most likely in its cheerless intolerance. Let us consider, for instance, with Professor Haldane, the simple act of milk. Consider so, time, consider so simple and time-honored a process as the milking of a the milk, which should have been an intimate an almost sacramental bond between mother and child is elicited by the deft fingers of the milkmaid and drunk, cooked, or even allowed to rot into cheese. We have only to imagine ourselves as drinking any of its other sort grief in order to realize the radical indecency of our relation to the cow. This is in order to show how, if it were proposed to milk a cow electrically, and we protested that it was indecent, we could be convicted of an age-long indecency in milking it with our hands. But biological inventions are, are abhorrent to humanity, and they call them indecent, Professor Haldane thinks. Yet such inventions, beginning as a perversion and monstrosity, monstrosity and as a ritual, even now surgical cleanliness is developing its rights and its dogmas, which, it may be remarked, are accepted most religiously by women. It is precisely the clinical rights of clean, cleanliness and the growth of a whole network of ordinances, whose administration might at first be in the hands of women, that will probably produce the most intensive ceremonial that has ever been elaborated, when the clinic becomes the temple, and the white-coated surgeon the officiating priest. Men will surpass themselves in cleanliness, spending the day in lustrations. The puritanic potentialities of science have never been forecast. If it evolves a body of organized rights and is established as a religion, hierarchically organized, things more than anything else will be done in the name of decency. The coarse fumes of tobacco and liquors, the consequent tainting of the breath and staining of white fingers and teeth, which is so offensive to many women, will be the first things attended to. A scantling of the immaculate, non-carnal world of the future can be examined on all sides today. Two ideas of freedom are involved in these opposite principles of the mechanical disposal of the detritus of life and the natural disposal of the same. A philosophy of dirt, which is a tract that should be added to Monsieur Keegan Paul's series, would oppose nature to art the ancient or animal world to the non-animal world of science. What we still call art is a science of the ancient world and of nature. Michelangelo, aside from his primitive titanism, would be a suitable hero of such philosophy, which would dwell on the admirable picture of this ancient master engaging in his yearly chains of boots and nether garments, which never quitted his body except to make way for a new outfit. We are told that when he pulled them off, the skin used to come away with them. His colossal prophetic images and scenes of the first creation and his rough personal habits would provide the requisite background for that thought that gave its preference to the natural. It would be contrasted with the world of the microscope and the minutia and tidiness that has been uh, preserved conventionally of the feminine. That squeamishness suggesting physiologically a bad conscience of the woman, always heading to some ascetic ritual of orderly automatism, would be there opposing the animal sans gêne of the workmen of the early world. Surgical cleanliness developing its rights is 
most religiously accepted by women. The liaison between the woman and applied science is, evident, is as evident as the ascetic tendencies of science, and the puritanic standards that must ensue as this organization grows. It is science that will lay by the heels the last descendants of the colossal, impetuous, adventurous wanderer of the early world, as well as the animally working pre-industrial man substituting the machine of far greater power than any animal or titan, controlled by some creature ectogenetically produced with a small beardless shaven head, very fussy about specks of dust and dirt, very partial to cosmic study, bitterly resenting anything indecorous, with most of the beliefs and innocence of the nursery, a highly organized, shrewd, androgynous Peter Pan. That is the logical forecast from the tendency of the moment. But of course, so many things may interfere with this that there is as much chance of its not reaching its goal as of its doing so.